Ladies and gentlemen, the moral encyclopedist of the American soul, our greatest writer, Mr. Norman Mailer. Uh, good evening. You know, um, the last time I spoke to a divided crowd was uh, back in Florida in about 19... 75. I've, I've never forgotten it. Tonight looks agreeable, but that night was the worst night I ever had in public <laughs> because uh, it, the uh, auditorium was a swimming pool. It was Florida. And in front of me as I spoke, there was a large body of water. It's all of you. <laughs> and off to the left were some students who had straggled in in the gloaming, because it took place at twilight, was talk. And the other side were other students. And I couldn't concentrate. I mean, the lapping of the water in the pool sort of pulled me in. <laughs> and ever since then, I've avoided divided audiences. But this is so uh, different <laughs> <laughs> that I gotta hope I rise to the occasion. Can you hear me out there? Yeah. Oh, boy. Oh boy, and I'm the guy who's against technology. <laughs> <laughs> now, this book, Oswald's Tale, has a peculiar history. Uh, there's a somewhat rascally man I know named Larry Schiller, who uh, is one of the great wheeler dealers in the world. If they measured that by uh, the standards they apply to athletes, he'd be a world-class wheeler dealer. And, and he spent a lot of time in Russia. He, at one point, he uh, directed a good bit of Peter the Great. So he'd been working in Russia off and on since about 1983, 82. And uh, during the time when uh, the Soviet Union was finally breaking up, he was there. He called me one day, and he said, uh, Norman, would you be interested in doing a book on uh, Lee Harvey Oswald in Minsk? because I think I've gotten the uh, uh, KGB to agree to give us the Oswald file. Well, I immediately said yes, because uh, I've been, I committed a literary sin a few years earlier, which is I'd written a 1,300-page novel. And as some of you may know, it ended with to be continued. <laughs> and I'm still hearing the curses. So I knew that I had to write the second volume, but I didn't know how to, because it was all about the KGB, the second volume, at least as I planned it, and I didn't know bird all about them, other than what I'd received in the American press and in our literature, and I knew enough to know that that was valueless. That whatever the KGB was, it was not what Ronald Reagan had been telling us it was. So I thought this would be a wonderful opportunity, and why are they giving us the file? You know, it seemed very hard to comprehend. And then I got over there. Now, Larry and I had worked on the executioner song, so I knew his methods. And they're extraordinary. He will do anything to attain the desired uh, uh, object. Uh, he would have made a great general, probably in the Civil War. <laughs> I mean, he wouldn't, have cared, he wouldn't have cared how many men it took to take a given objective. <coughs> and he would have been one of them. He always puts his own blood on the line. So I'm fond of him. He's a guy I've learned to work with. And he went over there to Russia, and the way he got the file, apart from other ways he got it, because he always works with about 50 different ways at once, but one way he did is he remembered that the Russians love literature and they love authors. You know, the Russians don't say Pushkin. They say Pushkin, Pushkin, as if they're holding a baby in their arms. They love Pushkin. In fact, in America, the only place you can hear a sound even remotely like that is Louisville. You know, <laughs> you know Mr. Mayor, do you love Louisville? <laughs> so, uh, he went to them and he said, you've got to let Norman Mailer obtain this file, because to begin with, an American author is the one who should write about Lee Harvey Oswald, because Oswald's an American. If you give it to the Russians, they won't understand it. And whereas if you give it to Mailer, uh, he will. He's our American Tolstoy. <laughs> can, you, 
can you keep Tolstoy from seeing this material? Now, that's why, one of the reasons Larry's invaluable. Can you imagine if I had gone up to the KGB and had said, I am the American Tolstoy? Yeah. <laughs> so that made a dent. I suspect, looking back on it now, that another reason was that they knew that the file was essentially um, empty of astonishing material, and that if they ever showed it to America and revealed it, nobody would believe it, because we believed they were the evil empire, and if they revealed it to uh, the CIA or the FBI or to the State Department, everybody would say it was a legend. They'd written the entire thing to cover their complicity in Lee Harvey Oswald. So I think that was one reason. And another was, I think they delighted in the idea that they were giving it to an American who wasn't official. Because um, it, would have, it would have humiliated them and pained them to give it to an official American organization. At the same time, they had to get rid of it. Because there had been this huge suspicion about Oswald and the KGB for uh, all these years. In fact, uh, after the assassination, uh, the KGB was convinced, since they had come to their own conclusion, that Oswald was uh, slightly unbalanced but harmless, that they couldn't conceive of him killing uh, President Kennedy uh, because once on a hunting trip in Minsk, he'd uh, missed a rabbit from 10 feet with a shotgun. <laughs> and he didn't know it at the time, but he was creating two generations of conspiratorialists with that one miss because anyone who's ever read that became convinced that obviously he couldn't have shot Kennedy. So they, so they wanted to get, uh, in effect, they wanted to get rid of a heavy burden. And um, I became uh, the mule. I was the one who was going to carry the uh, KGB records, in effect, out of, out of midst. Well, that was simple enough. I went over there with Larry, and we had a good translator, and uh, we started working very hard, and we holed up in Minsk for uh, almost six months, going to Moscow occasionally, occasionally going back to America, and spent a winter, the winter of 92-93, uh, uh, there. And it was tough, but not wholly disagreeable, because while living conditions were sort of, you know, not what we're quite used, used to, it, everybody lives at the same level, which is kind of at a mean level, but a perfectly possible level. But the food was terrible. If you look at me, you can see I have a certain interest in that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the fact of the matter is that you, you could be the wealthiest man in the world. Uh, I mean, you could be Ross Perot and you couldn't buy a good meal in Minsk. <laughs> so uh, you suffered that way. And you suffered with the weather. The sun never came out. After I was there for six months, I understood why Lee Harvey Oswald wanted to go back to America. <laughs> well, given all that and working like that, uh, this is for my cold. No one will believe me. <laughs> Working like that, we began to get into a waltz with the KGB, because now that they had promised us the papers, they began to function like every intelligence organization. People have this idea that intelligence organizations are monolithic, when in fact they are riddled with factions, enclaves, secret wars, open bureaucratic wars, disaffection, outrage, and fury toward their own people. And so, there were huge divisions in the KGB, huge divisions. Some people said, are you out of your mind? Who gave this to these Americans? They're probably CIA. What have you done? How stupid can you be? Others were saying, we gave a promise. This was important. He's the American Tolstoy. So you can see how, they, <laughs> you can see how it all developed uh, around us. And we're sitting there just frustrated because we can't get all this wonderful stuff we've been promised. We're getting it in drips and drabs. And then we begin to learn what's going on which is the KGB had a habit as uh, more developed po probably than in our own country by far of enlisting the aid of loyal patriotic Soviet citizens. 